I'm David Chatfield, and I want to introduce you to the experiments you'll be doing in Physical Chemistry One Laboratory. You can see the topics here. We'll begin talking about the lab notebook and the pre-lab and also the lab report. And then we'll talking about these, talk about the four experiments. So uh, first briefly about the lab notebook. Uh, this semester, you may use either a hard copy or an electronic lab notebook. Uh, if you use the electronic lab notebook, you may want to use OneNote, Microsoft OneNote. That's freely available to students at FIU, and you can read the instructions here. This will be available to you on Canvas, the slides from this, uh, from this presentation. Um, any other electronic laboratory notebook must be approved with the TA. It must be shareable. Now, uh, you will find the assessment rubric for the lab notebook on Canvas, uh, but here it is reproduced for you. So a lab notebook should have a table of contents, a title with purpose or goal, a pre-lab, the data records, and uh, optionally, any figures or calculations. I recommend keeping as much as you can in the lab notebook so that you have a complete record of what you've done for, for later, later looking. Um, the fine print, you can, you can read that on your own uh, later. Um, the lab, lab notebooks will be evaluated twice, uh, first after the first experiment. That's primarily for feedback and you simply bring the lab notebook to, to class. And then after the third experiment, um, and that'll be, that'll be uh, for a more complete grade. The first will have a, a grade as well, but um, it's primarily for feedback. Um, we're doing this before the fourth experiment because we won't be seeing you when you're finished with the fourth experiment. Uh, this is the uh, rubric for the pre-lab, <coughs> excuse me. The pre-lab should be uploaded to Canvas by 7 p.m. the evening before each experiment. And this will be, the, the, the due time will be on Canvas, so you'll see it. Um, there should be a title and statement of purpose, a bullet point list of steps, and um, a sketch of the apparatus and a list of the data to be collected. And I also ask you to list any sources of error that you anticipate. This is just to make you more aware so that when you're doing the experiment, you, you're, you're thinking about what, what, what could introduce error. Uh, the heart of this is the bullet, po bullet point list of steps, your notes to yourself. I do not want a copy of and paste from the lab manual. That will be longer than you can use effectively uh, in, in the pre-lab. This should be very simple and straightforward. Um, and Finally, the lab reports are to be uploaded to Canvas on the due date. That'll be in Canvas. It's generally a one week after the second day that's set aside for the experiment. Uh, there will be a few experiments for which there's no second day uh, set aside. Uh, in that case, it would be uh, generally two weeks after the first day set aside for the experiment. It will be in Canvas. Uh, you can see the criteria here in the rubric. There should be an abstract. It should be concise, never more than one paragraph. This is simply professionalism we're teaching you. Um, it states the purpose and summarizes the main results, including your best values, generally the average value with uncertainties, and also uh, lists your major conclusions. This is not a place to discuss your theory, not a place to discuss the procedure. Um, then your introduction and methods describes the purpose and the approach. These are actually two sections, but I group, we group them together in the abstract. Uh, the methods is very short generally because you simply reference the lab manual. There's no need to repeat it. You should only write something more specific if you deviate from the lab manual, then you must put that in there. Um, the results, that's where your raw data is. Uh, you may want to collect it as tables and graphs, all appropriately labeled. Um, uh, you should put one set of sample calculations, not all the calculations need to be there. The heart of the results is the discussion where you will probably compare your results with their uncertainties to the literature values and discuss 
the significance of any agreement or disagreement and discuss sources of error. Error is very important. So there you go. So um, at this point, um, are there any questions? You may stop this recording and perhaps discuss this with, with uh, your instructor or with your TA. So now on to the experiments themselves. Now, I just want to give you an overview of the experiments. Each team will be doing different experiments at each time, and you'll be reading the laboratory manual before the experiment quite closely, so you know everything you're supposed to do. This is just to give you an overview. It's tied to theory a little bit, but it's not all the details. That's for later, okay? Just wanna give you a sense right now of these experiments. So one experiment is the heat capacity ratios of gases. So the heat capacity is this Greek letter gamma, and it's the ratio of the constant pressure heat capacity to the constant volume heat capacity. And uh, it's in principle different for each gas. So you're gonna do measurements on a couple of gases. And uh, you may be wondering what, what, what this uh, gamma tells us. Well, it provides information on the spacing of vibrational energy levels, basically. It tells you about the microstructure, if you like, at the molecular level. So it's pretty cool, although it's pretty abstract. So um, here's the apparatus. And if you're watching this in the lab, um, the TA may you know, want to point out the apparatus to you. But here's a sketch of it. The uh, heart of it is this carboy right here which is a large plastic container. It's depicted in a water bath, but in your experiment, there will not be a water bath. Okay, this was cut and pasted from elsewhere. It will just be sitting on the lab bench. The lab, the um, carboy is connected to a gas cylinder um, and it's also connected to a manometer. So you will, uh, uh, I can go through the procedure at this point you'll fill the carboy with a gas, either argon or nitrogen. You'll do both of them. Um, and uh, you'll actually fill it to a positive pressure, so above atmospheric pressure, um, and record that pressure. Um, you will then lift and replace the stopper. This is gonna seem so simple, <laughs> hard to believe this tells you anything, but you'll carefully lift and replace the stopper. Um, and when you do that, uh, some gas will escape and temporarily the remaining gas will be at the room pressure, the atmospheric pressure. Um, and then the last step uh, is you will allow the temperature to equilibrate and you might be surprised, but when you raise and lower that stopper, the, the gas that remains in the carboy actually uh, gets cooler. And one thing you should do is think about why that is. So they're pr pretty fundamental physical principles, though it's not obvious unless you think at the molecular level. Um, um, well, you need to think at the bulk and the molecular level. Um, anyway, uh, once the temperature stabilizes, the pressure will increase again and you record P3. So you have these three pressures, P1, P2, and P3. Now, um, there are clamps to isolate the system uh, before you actually begin the experiment. All of those details are in the lab manual. Um, how do you determine gamma from your measurements? Very simply, if you have those three pressures, it's the log of P1 over P2 divided by the log of P1 over P3. So you should do five trials on each gas and that will give you an average gamma and you can get an uncertainty in gamma as well. Now, one thing I, I, I forgot to mention is that uh, you must measure the barometric pressure with the barometer um, sometime when you're during the day, when you're doing this experiment. I recommend right off the bat at the beginning because otherwise you might forget. Um, that manometer you were looking at uh, gives you the difference in pressure between what's in the carboy and what's outside. So to get the actual pressure, you have to add the barometric pressure. And if you forget the barometric pressure, all this work, and it will have been for nothing because you cannot compute your pressures. So <laughs> be sure you do that. Okay. Um, so that is, is the experiment itself. Now, just a word for 
um, why the different gases might have different temperature, uh, different um, heat capacities. Um, each gas, um, actually, whether it's yeah, each each diatomic gas, only nitrogen is diatomic, has a characteristic parameter, this theta sub v. Sometimes it's called the character characteristic, uh, the rotate the vibrational temperature, but it's not really a temperature. It just happens to have units of Kelvin. And anyway, so the basic question is, it, <clears throat> what is the value of the actual temperature relative to this characteristic, characteristic temperature? And as you'll see in the lab manual, and there's some justification, um, if the, temp the act absolute temperature is much less than the char characteristic temperature, then you would predict on the basis of theory that gamma, the, the heat capacity ratio is seven fifths. But if the temperature is much, much less than the characteristic temperature, the uh, heat capacity ratio will be nine sevenths. Otherwise, if theta is sort of close to t, the t, and you'll have to decide what, what close means, you'll find a value uh, for gamma that's in between these two values. So that will tell you something about the spacing between the vibrational levels. Um, we can read more about that in the lab manual. Um, so it's really cool, I think, that this very simple lifting and lowering of the stopper ultimately can tell you this much about your diatomic molecule. Now, you also have a monatomic molecule, that's the argon. Of course, there's no vibration for argon. It's just one, one atom, of course. So are there any questions? Um, if so, you might want to stop the recording and talk uh, with your TA about this. Another experiment you'll be doing is the enthalpy of combustion of an organic compound. And um, I've written right here a combustion reaction. This happens to be a benzoic acid. And the uh, enthalpy of combustion, the standard enthalpy of the combustion, as you can see, is 3, negative 3,228.79 kilojoules per mole. So that we know. <clears throat> um, you are going to uh, measure the enthalpy of combustion of naphthalene. Um, you'll be able to compare it to a lit the literature value, but this is really reproducing what was done in early science when, or early chemistry when the enthalpies of combustion weren't known. So you are seeing how these values were in fact uh, uh, determined and those tables put together. Um, so uh, the apparatus may be shown to you in the lab, but here's a schematic. So um, uh, what you have in the very center here is down here a little, a little uh, tray uh, or cup into which you have uh, a small amount, it's about a gram of your naphthalene, or you'll also do uh, measurements on benzoic acid as far as that goes. Um, that's inside then, uh, a very strong, thickly sided um, steel container. Uh, that is called the bomb. It will not explode, <laughs> um, but the combustion will take place inside of it. But it's so strong that uh, the combustion is fully contained. Uh, you'll fill this with oxygen, and then, of course, eventually you'll combust. Um, the, on the outside here is water. And then the whole thing is, 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 is plastic. Uh, and there's a stirrer here to get the, keep the water uh, moving around. And then you can measure the temperature. So the principle is you'll combust your unknown or your, your naphthalene or your benzoic acid. Uh, heat will be evolved. Um, heat will then uh, move through, this, through the container into the water. The flow of heat is into the water. The temperature of the water will rise. And you'll measure the rise in the temperature. For, from benzoic acid, since you know the enthalpy of combustion, you will be able to calibrate the heat capacity of your calorimeter. And when I say the heat capacity of the calorimeter, I mean everything. The heat capacity is the water and the stirrer and the bomb and everything all together. Um, you're measuring the temperature of the water and then you have a heat capacity. Um, so there's no point in calling it a molar heat capacity or something. It's just the heat capacity of this whole thing. 
So the procedure is you'll fill your calorimeter with a measured amount of water. You have to fill it with the same amount each time. Um, you'll place your sample in the bomb and fill it with, uh, charge it with oxygen. Um, and the bomb then goes inside the calorimeter. And then when you're ready, you'll ignite um, to cause the reaction to take place. There are firing leads here. And so there's, there's an electrical impulse that will actually start the reaction. Or the electricity will, will heat a little bit of wire till it's red hot. And that's what starts the reaction. And finally, you'll measure the temperature rise. Okay. So, so that's the principle. You have to be careful of a number of things. I'll just mention one of them. You'll, you'll see in detail. One is uh, later. One is that uh, you'll need to measure the temperature uh, for several minutes before you start the reaction because you need to see it achieve a baseline. Um, and then again, at the end, you'll need to let it, uh, once the reaction seems to be done, you should again uh, allow it to uh, achieve a baseline. Okay, now let's talk about the theory here. Now, first of all, the volume is, is constant, not the pressure. That's because the reaction takes place in, in this bomb, which has rigid walls. So what we're measuring is the internal energy of combustion, delta U, and not the enthalpy of the combustion directly. So um, I've got an equation down here, delta U plus Q is equal to zero. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you think of the calorimeter, including the bomb, as the system, um, everything all together, uh, that calorimeter is got adiabatic walls. They're not perfectly adiabatic, but pretty close to it. So the heat doesn't leak out of the calorimeter. It will a little bit. That's why you've got to be careful with your baselines. But um, that's why there's a zero on the right-hand side. The internal energy of the calorimeter, including the bomb and your substance, delta U is zero. Now what happens, of course, is that the combustion happens, heat's evolved, and then that heat uh, permeates the entire calorimeter. And so the water's temperature increases. So um, in this case, the Q is the heat that passes from the bomb um, uh, out into the water, essentially. So uh, the, heat in, in the delta U of the combustion plus that Q has to be equal to zero. Okay. So um, the delta U is actually the number of moles of your substance times the molar internal energy of combustion. So delta U with the subscript C is a molar quantity. Okay. Now the Q here will be the heat capacity of the, of the bomb calorimeter we just call that C sub B, C sub B just means for bomb calorimeter, times delta T. So for naphthalene, you have to know the uh, heat capacity of the calorimeter. Okay. So how do we determine, so let's suppose that you know the internal energy of combustion because you just calculated, figured it out from your experiment. How would you determine the enthalpy of, the enthalpy of combustion? Well, you uh, have seen in class, or you may need to read the manual, that delta HC is delta UC plus what the last, the second term on the right. Now, what does that mean? A delta N sub G uh, is, so G means gas. So N is moles of gas. And delta N is the change in the number of moles of gas um, during the reaction. So the, the final number of moles minus the initial number of moles of gas. So if you think about it, um, during reaction, you're starting with naphthalene and oxygen, but you're revolving carbon dioxide and in the water. Now the water uh, is there as a liquid, so that doesn't count, um, times RT. So um, from, the number of moles of uh, from the number of moles of naphthalene or benzoic acid you begin with, and from the stoichiometry you can figure out delta Ng, and therefore you can get delta H if you already have delta U. Okay, so there you go. Um, so the process is that you'll first do the whole uh, experiment for benzoic acid, 
um, and you'll need to do at least three runs. Now, the enthalpy via combustion is known for benzoic acid. Um, so uh, you're not actually determining the enthalpy of combustion from a benzoic acid. Instead, you're figuring out the heat capacity of your bomb calorimeter, Cb. Okay. So you get an average value of that heat capacity from your three runs. Um, then you'll do three runs of naphthalene, at least three successful runs, to determine the enthalpy of combustion of naphthalene and its uncertainty. It's very important to determine the uncertainty so you can compare with the literature value and uh, evaluate whether it agrees with the experiment. Um, so for the naphthalene, then you need to use the heat capacity that you already determined from benzoic acid uh, to, in, in the whole calculation. Okay. So that's roughly how it goes. So any questions? feel free to ask your TA and sort of pause this recording. So uh, moving along, the next, uh, the next experiment I want to discuss is the enthalpy of vaporization of water. Um, so here you've got a schematic of the vaporization process, liquid water and the blue part and above is, is, is the gas. So how would you measure the enthalpy of vaporization. Here's the apparatus. Uh, you'll see it in the room. Uh, the different components you see here are arranged a little differently, uh, but you'll see all the components there. So uh, you'll have, starting from the left, a round bottom flask containing water with a few boiling chips. That's the water you're going to boil to determine the enthalpy of vaporization. Um, You've got a thermometer here, so you can measure the, the, the temperature. Uh, and you've got a, a condenser here. So as you boil the water, you won't want it to boil too vigorously, by the way. Um, uh, but the, the vapor will be condensed and the water will, will uh, run back into the, bowl, into the round bottom flask. Um, you'll also see that in the middle is a ballast bulb. Um, your ballast bulb will be somewhere else, but it's, it's still there. And um, then on the right-hand side is a closed tube mercury manometer. So with this, you will be uh, uh, measuring the, uh, uh, the, the, the pressure when you reach the boiling point. Okay. So, um, What's the process, the procedure? I'm sorry, these things got out of order here, in animation wise, but uh, you'll place the water in the flask with the boiling chips. Um, you'll establish a low pressure with the vacuum pump. Now, um, your uh, round bottom flask is sitting inside a heating metal that's connected to a rheostat and you'll adjust the rheostat and turn it on and adjust it so that uh, you heat. So um, after you establish your low pressure, you'll begin the heating process and you'll simply have to wait. There's a lot of waiting involved in this experiment, um, but eventually you'll find it boils and you want a medium boil and you'll have to determine what a medium boil is for your own, for yourself and record the temperature and the pressure at the same time. <clears throat> It's very important that you record the temperature and the pressure at the same time. The pressure may fluctuate a little bit, um, even though you've you know, first established it with the vacuum pump. Um, you must measure them at the same time. That way, if there's any drift, by the way, in the, in the, in the manometer uh, reading, uh, it won't matter so much because you're measuring pressure and temperature at the same time. Okay. Then having done that, um, uh, you will increase the pressure. And of course, when you increase the pressure, the boiling point increases. So, so this boiling will stop. And um, uh, the, the manual gives you guidelines on how, by how much you should increase the pressure, but it's about 30 to 40 torr. Um, and you take about 10 readings between uh, 400 torr and 760 torr. And uh, then from those 10 boiling points of the different pressures, you will determine 
the enthalpy of vaporization. So how does that occur? So you will see uh, in the lecture course a little later, probably, um, an equation, it's called the clausius clapeyron equation, and that relates temperature, pressure, and um, uh, the enthalpy of vaporization. So um, here we are. So um, here it's in differential form. Sometimes you'll, you won't see it. You'll see it in another form without the, without the d log pd1 over t. The process is you measure t versus p for a range of pressures. Then you'll plot log p versus 1 over t. And the slope is, according to this equation, negative enthalpy of vaporization divided by r. So you'll do a regression to determine uh, the enthalpy of vaporization and its uncertainty. All of this is in the lab manual. This is just giving you an overview of how it works. Yeah. So uh, one little technicality, what we just described uh, assumes that the enthalpy of vaporization is independent of temperature. Actually isn't. Um, there's a small dependence on temperature and the lab manual will tell you uh, how you can take that into account. So um, any questions on this experiment? You may want to pause here. OK, uh, one more experiment I want to describe to you. Uh, the title is The Kinetics of, of the Mutarotation Reaction of Glucose. Um, so uh, to give you the uh, framework here, so uh, glucose is depicted right here. Um, uh, it has two isomers. D-glucose has two isomers. One we call alpha, one we call beta. They can interconvert. There's ring opening and then uh, the red portions here, the hydrox hydroxyl group and the hydrogen, they can interconvert where they are. And then the ring closes and you get alpha or beta. Um, so, so there you go. Now these are both, uh, this is a chiral molecule. And so uh, it will rotate polarized light um, that is sh uh, shown on the sample. And each of these isomers rotates the polarized light to a different extent. Uh, and so that's characterized with this uh, quantity called the specific um, rotation, uh, alpha in the square brackets, D, and then uh, the 25 is for the temperature, that's 25 degrees Celsius. You may not be at exactly 25 degrees Celsius, but the variation with temperature is slow, so this will be just fine. Okay. So um, you will be measuring the rate at which this uh, uh, interconversion reaction takes place. It's called a muta rotation. Um, so you'll be doing measuring the kinetics, the rate constants, and also, also the equilibrium constant. Um, so now one confusing thing about all of this, by the way, is that we have alpha and beta glucose, and then the standard symbol for the uh, rotation is also an alpha. So we, we have to deal with that. Um, so the principle is that the ratio of alpha to beta, the two isomers in a dry sample of D-glucose that you'll be given is not at the equilibrium ratio for D-glucose dissolved in water. So that's great because then you can, you can actually monitor the kinetics. So you'll prepare samples of D-glucose in solution and you'll measure the rate of the change of the optical rotation using a polarimeter. And from the rate data, you'll determine rate constants for the process. Now, turns out that the acid, the reaction is acid catalyzed. It will take place without, without the acid, but it's so slow that you don't have time <laughs> to follow that in in the lab. So you'll actually measure it for different, the rate for different concentrations of acid. Um, so let's talk about the rate law. Um, so uh, here we have the rate of change of the concentration of uh, the alpha. So I'm using capital A in this case for the alpha isomer and capital B for the beta isomer. Otherwise we have the alpha is doing double duty, it gets too confusing. So that's what we got going on. So that rate of change is given to, and what you see on the right-hand side. So there are two rate constants. Uh, K1 is for the forward reaction and K minus one is for the backward reaction. 
So um, now this reaction is de derived in the lab and it's equ this equation is derived in the lab manual. So uh, you can read about it there. Just take, just take it for granted for now. So alpha is the, <clears throat> um, the degree of optical rotation. Um, this is the, actually what you'd read right off of, out of the calorimeter. The specific rotation uh, is uh, 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 a little different. It's a standard quantity for each of those isomers, and you can read exactly how it's defined in the lab manual. But here the alphas are exactly what you're measuring. Um, alpha naught is your initial uh, alpha. Alpha equilibrium is if you wait long enough so that the, the angle of rotation stops changing, optical rotation stops changing. And then alpha T is uh, the rotation at some particular time point. Anyway, so that log on the left is equal to K observed times T. Now K observed is actually the sum of K1 and K minus um, one. We're not gonna ask you to determine K1 and K minus one individually, just K observed, but you actually could, you've got enough data to figure them out. Maybe you'd like to think about that. So the procedure is to prepare your samples, measure the optical rotation as a function of time. So you just have a stopwatch and every minute you'll read off what the rotation is. Then you'll plot the left-hand side. So LHS means left-hand side. Plot the left-hand side of this equation versus T and the slope gives you K observed. Now, a complication. K observed actually depends on the concentration of the hydrogen ion. And so this, this other equation, K observed, it's, this is a an known equation for this reaction uh, is a Kn, which will be the rate constant uh, with, uh, the, in, in for neutral. In other words, if there's no acid constant uh, at plus, Ka, which is the rate constant when there is acid present, and then that's times the hydronium ion, the hydrogen ion. So the full procedure is you're actually going to prepare samples with different hydrogen ion concentrations using uh, uh, perchloric acid. Um, then you'll determine uh, K observed for each of those, uh, just the way we did on the previous slide. And then you plot K observed versus the hydrogen ion concentration. And from that, you have enough data to determine Kn and Ka. So that is it. That was really fast. You'll learn more about each of these when you uh, reactions, experiments, when uh, you read about them in the lab manual. There's also a video on each experiment that you should watch. And in fact, the theory is covered in the video in a bit more detail than I I gave you here. This is just sort of overview, so you know where all of this is going in the next uh, couple of months in this laboratory class. So um, stop the video if you like, take questions, and that is the end of this presentation. I hope that it was helpful, and I wish you a good experience with your experiments.